in the 25th chapter of the book of Exodus. This is the 14th message on the tabernacle in the wilderness. And we are speaking tonight on the subject of the mercy seat. And I'll omit the reading of the scripture that describes the Ark of the Covenant, verses 9 through 16. And we'll begin reading at verse 17, which describes the mercy seat or the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubim be. Thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Just a few brief words, we trust, of review about the tabernacle in the wilderness is in order. First of all, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, the Jews, call them what you will, had been in Egyptian bondage for 400 and some years. God delivered them with a strong hand by the blood of the Passover lamb, they crossed the Red Sea by faith, entered into the wilderness of Zin, and there they wandered for 40 years. When they first entered the wilderness, God called Moses up into the Mount of Horeb, and there in 40 days and nights instruction, he instructed Moses to build him a house. He told Moses he wanted him to build him a place of meeting a place of communion, a place where he could dwell in the midst of his people. The people were strangers and pilgrims and foreigners in a hostile land. They were God's people, redeemed by the blood, and the Lord wanted to manifest to all his divine presence. So Moses came back from the mound with the instructions, and this is the building that God instructed Moses to build. Very strange and peculiar sight it was, covered with goat and ram skin and badger skin. Inside, fine embroidered linen and spun gold. Golden chariot bins interwoven with cunning handwork in the ceiling of the tabernacle, looking down on two rooms, one 30 foot square, one 15 foot square, one 30 foot long rather, and one 15 foot long. Divided in two, these two rooms were called the Holy Place and the Holy of Holies. There were only four articles of furniture inside the tabernacle. There was the table of golden, golden table of showbread. There was the golden lampstand. There was the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant. The Holy of Holies was separated from the Holy Place by a great veil. And the high priest was only allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies once a year. He entered in once a year on the great day of atonement, but only then could he go in with the basin of blood in his hands, and he went for the purpose of sprinkling the mercy seat, the strange lid that covered the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a small box, four and a half by two and a half feet in width, two and a half feet in depth, made of desert wood and overlaid with purest gold. And in this Ark of the Covenant were the three articles that we spoke to you about last week, the broken tables of stone, which had the commandments of God, the golden pot of manna, and the rod of Aaron that budded. On top of the Ark, a heavy lid of solid gold was constructed. Either end of this solid gold lid had a golden cherubim. Now, I can't accurately describe a cherubim to you, 
But a cherubim is an angelic creature. He has wings, this we are told. He has a face. He has feet. For Isaiah, who saw the gold, who saw the real cherubims before the throne of God, described them as having six wings, two to hide their face, and two to hide their feet, and two to fly with. And these angelic creatures, called the four living creatures or the beasts in the book of Revelation, are intimately connected with the holiness of God. For whenever they are seen and whenever they are heard, they are seen at the throne of God, and they are heard to say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. They, with the flaming sword, kept the way of life in the Garden of Eden. These cherubims seen by Ezekiel, seen by Isaiah, seen by John on the Isle of Patmos, seem to be the guardians of the holiness of God, and they seem to have the peculiar ministry of seeing that his righteousness is vindicated, that his holiness is avenged in the case of sin. So this strange seat, poured out of solid beaten gold, had a golden cherubim on either end, and their wings touched over the mercy seat, and their faces ever looked downward upon that golden lid. Now all of this is unimportant. We are not interested in the dimensions of the tabernacle. The facts and figures and specifications of the tabernacle of our, are of no interest. Because in the book of Hebrews we are assured in the New Testament that the purpose of studying the tabernacle and the purpose of learning of it is to see and to know the person of Christ and his work of redemption at Calvary's cross. All of the furniture in the tabernacle, all of the appointments in the tabernacle, all of the details of the tabernacle are instructive of Christ. What then is the meaning of the Ark of the Covenant that stayed back in that sacred and holy place in the presence of God alone, and what means this golden lid? which is called the mercy seat. First of all, in the study of the tabernacle, you will learn that this Ark of the Covenant was more or less the throne of God. It was the place where he dwelt. It was the place where his presence was manifested. This golden box with its seat or lid was actually the earthly throne of God. An approach to that earthly throne was the picture story of man's approach to God now on his heavenly throne. If you want to know how to come to God, then read about the tabernacle and learn how he told the Israelites to approach him in earthly worship. And you will know how now sinful man can approach him in the tabernacle in heaven. The strange box was the throne of the God who dwelt in the midst of his people, of the God who dwelt between the cherubim. Now one of the strange things are these two cherubim. And they are highly significant because first of all, two is the number of testimony. So how do you decide that? Well, the law says in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Two witnesses God always requires to establish his word. So there are two witnesses to the mercy seat. These two witnesses are cherubims depicting the real cherubims of heaven whose ministry it is to bear testimony to the holiness of God. Now these cherubims are in a fixed position, because God in these mysterious symbols was revealing to man things about himself. These cherubims had their wings touching. In other words, the holiness of God overshadowed his throne, spread a canopy over the very dwelling place of God, 
so that no man could approach but by the holiness of God. For without holiness, the word says, no man shall see the Lord. And the faces of these cherubims, or guardians of his holiness, are in a fixed position. And their faces, we are told, shall ever look towards the mercy seat in verse 20. So their faces were ever pointing downward. Now what was in this box that they were so intently gazing upon? The golden cherubims looking constantly at this box. What would their gaze meet with within the box? In the box was the Ten Commandments stone which had been broken at the Mount of Sinai. Inside was the golden pot of manna, and if you remember reading Israel's experience with the manna, and remember reading John 6, you will recall that Jesus himself was the fulfillment of the manna in the wilderness. God sent Christ down to give life to the world as he sent the man of old. And Jesus in John 6 said that he was the literal fulfillment of the Old Testament manna. And now recall that when Israel was fed so graciously on the manna, they came to the place where they despised and loathed the manna of God. And they rejected it for flesh. They cried out in their prayers to God, Give us flesh, lest we die. They lusted, the Bible says, for flesh, and they loathed. God's manna, who was Christ. Not only did they break God's law and dance about a golden calf, but they loathed his Christ. And the third article was the rod of Aaron that budded. And I call it the rod of rejection. For they rejected Aaron's priesthood. They despised God's choosing of Aaron and they wanted other rods instead of Aaron's, but it was Aaron's that budded and gave the testimony of divine calling. Now, let me recap for a minute. This Ark of the Covenant and this mercy seat was really the throne of God. The golden cherubims are typical of the real cherubims who are the guardians of his holiness and this throne of God surrounded and overshadowed by his holiness witnesses that the cherubims are looking downward and when they look down upon the ark they behold all of the testimony of man's sin they see the law which he has broken the manna which he loathed, and the rod which he rejected, and the guardians of God's holiness have the responsibility of seeing that God's holiness is avenged and his righteousness declared. And were it not for one thing, these angelic watchmen would insist upon God's wrath destroying the people. But between the cherubims and the ark, between God and the evidences of man's sin, he provided for the sprinkling of the blood. And when the high priest came into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled the blood of atonement on that mercy seat, the angel eyes were no longer upon the evidences of his sin, but then they gazed upon the precious blood. The testimony is this, that the throne of God, which without the blood is a throne of judgment, has become with the blood a throne of grace. Now this is very, very important because in Romans 3.25, if you'll turn in the New Testament with me, please, 
We have a verse that sheds light upon this Old Testament passage. Speaking of Christ Jesus in verse 24, he says, Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just, the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now the Holy Spirit says in these verses that God set forth Christ. The phrase set forth means to expose to public view. It means to reveal. Why did God reveal his Son Christ to the world? Why did he set him forth? Why did he expose him to public view? Why did he allow him to suffer the humiliation of Gethsemane, Pilate's judgment hall, the ridicule of the people through 33 years of earthly ministry, the total rejection by the nation, the scourging on the eve of his death, the spittle, the mockery, the deriding priests and scribes. Why did God suffer him to die the death of the cross, even turning his own back on him, forsaking him, plunging him into outer darkness? The answer is given by the Holy Spirit that he was set for to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Now the word propitiation means satisfaction, complete and total satisfaction. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the original Hebrew scriptures, the word translated here by our English word propitiation is the same word translated in the Old Testament in the Septuagint as mercy seat. And here is a precious truth. The Holy Spirit in reality is saying that God sent Jesus and he set him forth and exposed him to human view to make of him a mercy seat. For there was God on his throne longing to meet with man and longing to commune with him. But every time his cherubims looked downward to earth, every time his holiness surveyed earth, all this God of holy and pure eyes beheld was the broken law upon the heart of man, the hatred of his son, and the rejection of his divine priesthood. All his holiness saw in earth was a ruined race of sinners. God cannot forgive sin in the sense of just writing it off the record. Not even Almighty God can do that. Sin must be atoned for. Sin must be paid for. God is not vengeful. It is not vengeance that he seeks upon the sinner. It is justification of his own righteousness and verification of his own word. He said the soul that sinneth, it must die. And sin is a direct insult to the holiness of God. Sin is a direct rebellion against the heart of God. Sin is a direct attack against the throne of God. Sin represents insurrection and spiritual anarchy. And even though God's love and God's mercy would spare the sinner and embrace the revolutionary, yet God's holiness 
and God's righteousness and God's justice cries out for his death. Here is God on his throne, and when his holiness surveys man's heart, he finds that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he finds that by man's nature alone he is trespasser of his holy law, despiser of his heavenly bread, the Lord Jesus, and a rejecter of his priesthood. And so, because this situation existed, God set forth his Son to come between what man was and what he was and become, as the Greek has it here, a mercy seat through faith in his blood. And I pray, God, that I might be enabled to make this verse so plain that the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and his burial and his resurrection came between man and God shed his blood in answer to the righteous demands of the law and the word of God covering the mercy seat so that even the holy eyes of God could not see beyond that precious sprinkling of blood. For it says in this verse that Christ himself became the mercy seat. He became blood sprinkled. He became that which satisfied God so that God's righteousness was declared for he did not renege one bit on his word when he said the soul that sinneth it should die for he spared not his son but delivered him up for us all. His righteousness was declared for all our iniquities and our transgressions and our sins were laid on him. His righteousness was declared because God spared Christ nothing, put him to the same death every sinner must die who dies without him, plunged him into the same outer darkness so that he experienced the same separation from God that every lost sinner must experience. His righteousness was declared for every claim of the law and every penalty was met by the Lord Jesus Christ. His righteousness was declared so that God in remitting sins that were past could be just. And yet at the same time, he could be the justifier of the ungodly. Being a father, I know what a joy it must have been to the Father's heart to find a way to cause the penalty he himself had promised to pass over his son and yet be just in embracing him in a display of his love. And God found such a way at the cross of time beneath was the eternal testimony of man's sin and his ruined state. Above was the unchanging testimony of a holy God who could not be approached by sinful man. But in between that holy God and that sinful man came a mercy seat. That mercy seat was Christ. He changed the whole throne of God for he changed this throne of God from a throne of judgment to a throne of grace. He changed this whole throne from one which cried out daily for his holiness to be avenged to one that cried out daily to the sinner to come boldly to the throne of grace. Jesus changed all of heaven 
and he has changed us that we might go to heaven. He changed the very throne of God. He came between the holy eye of God and the sinful heart of man in such a way that God himself said, Your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more. Cast them behind his back, buried them in the depths of the deepest ocean, forgotten and forgiven, cleansed and made pure, so that even the vilest of sinners can approach the holy God if they come by the blood sprinkled mercy seat. Jesus is that mercy seat. Now those cherubims of heaven look down, but when they look down, they see no further than the precious blood. When they look down, the broken law is covered, the loathing of the manna is covered, the rejection of the rod is covered. When they look down now, they see but one thing, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it testifies that God himself is satisfied so that even the cherubims are at rest in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now that blood, according to Hebrews 12, 24, speaks better things than that of Abel's. This blood says peace and grace and love and forgiveness to the sinner. Now, the Bible teaches the earthly tabernacle is gone. There is no earthly meeting place between man and God. Oh, don't you wish all the world could understand that? Little children go down the street hand in hand with their mommies and daddies and they pass a fine stone building on the corner and the little child says, what is that, daddy? And he says, that's a church. And he says, what's a church? And 99 times out of 100 he is told that's the house of God. And the little boy grows up believing that God lives in that big house and on Sundays, God comes out in the sanctuary and meets with the people and goes back in the curtains and stays for the other six weeks or other six days. And Sunday is the only time this God shows himself in this big building. This is the house of God. It's his dwelling place. That's what we are taught. But Paul, preaching in Athens, at the very beginning of the Christian age, said, God dwells not in temples made with hands. There is the church building in the world that contains God. There is the church organization in the world that has corralled him. God is a spirit. He lives in a building which cannot be seen. He lives in a temple that cannot be seen by human eye. That temple that building, Paul describes in the New Testament, is made up of stones, but they are not dead stones, they are living stones. And the living stones are believers, precious living stones quarried out of the pit of sin, polished by the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, and placed by his baptism into that holy building in which God lives. He doesn't live in any earthly building. The tabernacle is gone and its service is discontinued. Man mocks it and every religionist builds his little building and claims that it is the dwelling place of God. But the New Testament tells us that the tabernacle is now in heaven. That God is on his mercy seat in heaven and that this mercy seat has now been sprinkled with a blood which is better than the blood of bulls and goats. That this blood was the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and that any poor sinner who by faith can comprehend that can come by faith to the very presence of God and be received not only by a holy God but by a loving Father. Now the Bible teaches that Jesus' actual, literal, incorruptible, eternal blood is now this moment on an actual, literal, eternal mercy seat in an actual, literal place called Zion, that heavenly city where God dwells with his innumerable company of angels, with the spirits of just men now made perfect, and with those whose names are written in the book of life. I believe that because God says so, and I've never seen into the glory, and I've never seen that precious blood, but I know it's there, and it's as real to me as you people are tonight, for I've seen it by faith and comprehended it with a heart that believes God's testimony. Now the question is, how did Jesus' precious blood get on heaven's mercy seat? How did it get to the secret place of the Most High? How was it brought into this holy place and sprinkled under the eyes of the Holy God? Well, you can study this in your spare time, but read the resurrection account in John 20. We have a strange and unusual happening. On the resurrection morning, very early in the morning, just as it was coming daylight, Mary was walking in the garden, heartbroken, because they had taken away her Lord, and she knew not where they had laid him. Suddenly she heard a voice behind her, and the voice cried, Mary. And when the voice cried her name, she knew it was the Lord Jesus. She fell at his feet, would have laid hold of him to hold him, but he commanded her, and this is what he said, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. And the Greek is a little more specifically, Touch me not, for I am about to ascend to my Father. Now you go down to Galilee and tell my brother, and there I will see them. And with that he was gone. A few hours later in Luke 24, we read that Jesus appeared on that resurrection evening to the saints gathered in the upper room. And they were afraid because they thought they had seen a spirit. But Jesus said to them, Here, handle me. Touch me and see. Does a spirit have flesh and bone? I am no spirit. Come handle me. And eight days later, in the evening, he said to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold the wounds in my hands, and reach forth your hand and thrust it into the wound in my side, and be faithless. No, don't be faithless, but be believing. So here on the resurrection morning, we have the Lord Jesus forbidding Mary to touch him. In the resurrection evening, a few hours later, he offers for all his disciples to touch him and be sure that he's real and know that it is he who was dead and buried and now raised from the dead. The answer is in his statement, I am now ascending, or I have not yet ascended to my Father. The Lord Jesus was fulfilling the ministry of the great high priest, on the Day of Atonement. The great Day of Atonement, dear brethren, and I say this after many years of thought and study, the great Day of Atonement was not the day that Jesus died. The great Day of Atonement was the day he carried the blood into the Holy of Holies. At his resurrection, Hebrews 9:12 says, He by his own blood entered into the holy place, and obtained an eternal redemption for us. And that eternal redemption was not obtained until God's holy cherubim looked upon the blood, not at Calvary, 
but the blood in heaven. The blood on the mercy seat, not at the brazen altar. The blood sprinkled over the ark of the covenant, not on the ground of the court of the Gentiles. This was the court of the Gentiles, and this was the brazen altar. Calvary was situate in the court of the Gentiles, outside the city of Jerusalem. Calvary's cross was the brazen altar, but heaven's throne was the Holy of Holies. And the great day of atonement was when Jesus carried his own precious blood on the morning of resurrection into the presence of God and obtained an eternal redemption for us. Now according to the 22nd verse, the mercy seat becomes two things. It is a meeting place, for there I will meet with thee, and it is a place of communion, for there I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. And this thought today has been on my heart. The throne of God is a meeting place. We commonly in this regard think of it as a place where the saints meet. But the throne of God is a place where all men must meet. God, however, has two thrones. He has that throne which is called the throne of grace. But he has another throne which is called the great white throne. In Revelation 20, we are told that there is coming a time when God will judge the rejectors of his Son. The dead, small and great, shall stand before him. And in that hour, when this judgment comes to pass, heaven and earth shall flee away and there will be found no place for them. All that will meet the sinner at the judgment of God at that great white throne depicting his utter holiness where the cherubim will insist upon the avenging of his offended righteousness. The only thing that shall greet the sinner there will be the Lord Jesus Christ upon that throne. For John 5.22 says that the Father judges no man but has committed all judgment unto the Son. Do you know that the sinner will never meet God in judgment, that he must meet Jesus. Jesus bore the judgment of this world himself. Now is this world judged, he said, concerning the cross. All judgment of the world was exercised upon Christ and his death. Now judgment is no longer a matter for God. It is a matter for the Son. The rejecting sinner will not meet God. He will meet Jesus. Yet the boastful sinner, and I've had this statement made to me, takes comfort in the thought that I'll plead my case directly with God. I'll not have to deal with this Jesus. But the Bible tells us that lost sinners must deal with Jesus. And oh, what a fearful sight, for it is the great day of his wrath. And who will be able to stand? A lamb wounded unto death, rising in anger, must be a fearful sight that no human words can describe. What will the lost sinner say when he looks and beholds the judge and looks in his hands and feet and in his side and sees that the wounds of Calvary are there, the wounds he has hated, the suffering he rejected, the death he refused, the substitute he despised. He has become his judge. Nothing to greet him but the books. And the books are open. And every man judged according to those things in the book. And because his name is not found written on the book of life, he is cast into the lake of fire. Now all men must meet God at his throne. They will meet him in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ at the great white throne. 
or they could meet him now face to face at his throne of grace by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ oh what a meeting it will be but what a meeting it is now all day my heart's been filled with thanksgiving for the mercy seat thanking God for the mercy seat seemed like every thought that crossed my mind today was just thank God for the mercy seat thank God for the mercy seat for I've already met him looked him in the face and even though knowing what a sinner I am knowing how vile and depraved filthy and abominable the cesspool of my heart is yet I can look directly into the face of a holy God and because I know that blood sprinkled mercy seat is between us I have peace with God in spite of the fact that I am filled with the knowledge of my sin I am filled with the comfort of his blood even though I am constantly aware of my wicked heart I am also made aware of God that is satisfied for he said when I see the blood I will pass over you back in Luke 18 we have the parable of the Pharisee and the sinner who went down to the temple to pray and the Pharisee boasted in his works tried to meet God by the books boasted in his tithing in his self-righteousness lifting up his eyes to heaven and stretching out his arms as he stood standing certain that he was accepted in the sight of God and while he was praying a poor sinner slipped in stood by his side feared even to lift his eyes toward heaven but just hung his head in shame and cried God be merciful to me a sinner in the Greek this Jewish sinner who slipped into the temple to pray used a word which we have used in our message tonight it is the word translated propitiation in Romans 3.25 and the word translated in the Septuagint always as mercy seat and as this old sinner prayed this instructed Jew was praying this looking downward ashamed to look towards heaven he cried God be towards me as you are when you look upon the blood sprinkled mercy seat that's what he prayed when he prayed God be merciful to me a sinner for the word merciful is our word mercy seat propitiated satisfied and Jesus said I tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the Pharisee justified means to have a right standing with God to be saved to have the forgiveness of sin how did he get it he got it by coming to God by the blood sprinkled mercy seat now God is mercy seated toward the whole world tonight the sinner does not need to pray that God will find a way to sprinkle his mercy seat with blood the sinner need only pray as the sinner of old God be to me as you are when you look upon the blood of the Lord Jesus what is that satisfied propitiated and this is the prayer that every sinner prays in one word or another it is the groaning of his heart every sinner that is saved by grace prays this prayer in its meaning whether the words are the same or not does not matter but from the depth of his heart every sinner saved by grace has once prayed God save me by the merits of Jesus blood now this meeting place has also become a communion place for the sinner saved by grace who has met God in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus 
has also found a place of communion over the blood-sprinkled sea. You know, there's something interesting back in the book of Genesis, chapter 9, that when the flood was over and uh, God made promise to Noah and his seed that he would never again destroy the world by water, and he gave him a sign of that covenant. The sign was a rainbow. And there's a play on words in the Hebrew in that passage that I can't correctly interpret nor rightly describe. But there is a play on words to this effect that God meant to say to Noah that this bow set in the clouds would be the meeting place between him and Noah. That when man was fearful of God's judgment, he need only look up and rest his eye upon the bow. And there in the bow he would meet the face of God looking back at him. For God was looking at man through the bow, and man was looking toward God through the bow. And the bow was the sign of the word of God that judgment was passed. The mercy seat became such a meeting place. The fearful heart who thinks of God's judgment, he doesn't look up to God. He looks rather at the mercy seat now sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. And there, when his eyes fall upon that sprinkled sea, he meets reflected there the eye of God. And there God is satisfied, and there man is satisfied. And dear brethren, if God is satisfied with the blood, should we not also be satisfied with it? If he says it is enough, should we not also say it is enough? If he has said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, is it not enough to say then this is all my hope and peace, all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus? I like that statement we had here not long ago by a brother who wrote us a letter and he said, if I go down, I go down trusting in him. A man once told me, you're wrong. Eternity will show it, you're wrong. And I said, yes, but if I die lost and if I go to hell... I go trusting in Jesus' blood. Let us pray. Father, we pray that there should not be a soul here tonight who has not once and forever rested as far as their soul's salvation and the forgiveness of their sins in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are satisfied with it. We are satisfied. You say it has remitted sins. We accept from you the forgiveness of those sins. You say that you have peace. Oh, Father, then we have peace in the blood of Christ. We cannot understand it, but we do believe it. And we accept it. And know that it is true, for it has worked in our hearts the immutable evidence and testimony of its effectiveness. For it has worked peace with God. Bless this message to thy glory in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you.